Hey, what's up, Street Talks? Eric Kim from the Eric Kim Street Photography Blog. It is a beautiful Saturday morning and another good time to make a new lecture that hopefully will help you guys. So the, the title for today's lecture is Why it is important to work... Oh, I did the quotes at the wrong time. Why it is important to, quote, quote, work the scene in street photography. So the reason I wanted to do this presentation was because... I see a lot of problems that street photographers make and the common mistake is you see a good scene, you only take one photo and then you leave. Um, that is how, when you're starting off, uh, most people do it. I know I personally shot street photography that way because I was just afraid and you know you kind of get the fight or flight technique. You take a photo of a stranger, they look at you, your heart starts racing and you just want to get the hell out there, right? Um, in street photography, you see a scene once and it's only going to be there once. And if you don't capture the moment at that exact moment, you'll never see it again. So there's a, a phrase that I like to follow. It's um, Jeff Bezos from Amazon, the CEO. He has what he calls a quote, quote, regret minimization framework. What he means by that is he wants to live a life where you know, when he's 80 years old, he'll look back in his life and try to live a life without regrets. So in street photography, have you ever had an instance where you saw a great scene? You only took one scene or even worse didn't take the photo at all and then went to sleep that night and just thought about that photo you should have taken and been like damn i should have taken that shot so regret your minimis uh so of all of this quote quote regret minimization framework in street photography and whenever you see a good scene do not regret not taking the photo um i talked a lot about this uh, in a previous lecture the importance of harnessing your fear in street photography so if you see a good scene and then your heart starts thumping, your heart is also telling you that it's a good scene and then you have to capture the moment. Uh, sometimes I have the problem where I'm shooting for an entire day and I don't see anything interesting, but suddenly I see a scene or a person and my heart starts thumping. And that's pretty much my body telling me, Eric, that's an interesting shot. You have to take the shot. And the only reason your heart is beating so hard is because you know it's an interesting shot, but you're scared to take the shot. So anyways, harness your fear to make uh, good street photos. So I'm going to show you the importance of quote, quote, work in the scene. Generally, when street photographers uh, you know, are out shooting, I, they have what they call, or I like to call the quote, quote, myth of the decisive moment. What do I mean by the myth of the decisive moment? Well, if you've ever seen the work of Henri Cartier-Bresson, um, this guy right here, one of the founding fathers of street photography, and he essentially was able to popularize what they call the decisive moment, and what he defines as the decisive moment is that split fraction of a second where you see a great scene, and you only take one shot and you capture the moment. The myth, the reason they called it this, uh, the myth of the decisive moment is because off, often people look at the photos and they just think, oh, he must have only just taken one shot at the scene, but in reality, he had to quote, quote, work the scene. So if you look at this photo, a very famous photo by Cartier Bresson, uh, what comes to mind? Or what do you find interesting? So, when I look at this image, the reason I'm really touched by it is because you, know, you have this broken wall and it's in the middle of uh, war. And it, despite all of that, you have all these kids happy and you know just kind of having a good time. And the message this photo tells me is, you know, despite all this terror and you know, destruction, you know, there's still happiness in life. But most photographers might look at this photo and say, oh man, he caught the decisive moment, that peak moment where all the great things came together and the composition just became perfect. And he only just took one shot. But how many photos do you think he actually took? Guess. Boom. How many photos did he take? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So you took 16 shots. And, you know, if you want to learn more about uh, contacts, uh, these contact sheets, which are the behind the scenes uh, shots that he had to get up to the scene, there's a great book called Magnum Contact Sheets. I'll link to it in the, the show notes. And it's an excellent, you know, behind the scenes look into the working minds of all these great photographers. And 
in this in this case you see that Cartier Brisson got the shot in the first shot because you know he circled it and highlighted it and there's actually another photo in the top right corner that he thought was a maybe shot so you don't really know when you're going to get the shot you have to kind of work the scene and you know it's not just putting your camera into to burst mode and just kind of click 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 like a machine gun but it's being conscious it's taking a step closer taking a step back taking a step to the left taking a step to the right shooting a vertical shooting a horizontal Another interesting thing to note in this photo is that um, Cartier Bresson alternated between horizontal and vertical shots depending on what kind of composition he wanted. So, you know, if there's, these are some close ups of the contact, so we could take a look together. So, this is the first shot, and, you know, he got the best shot. The second shot, the kids are aware of his presence. Um, the shot after that, he decided to take a vertical shot because he saw an interesting elbow arm gesture from this kid in front. His nice little triangle composition right there. Um, the shot after, he thought this might have been the, the other maybe shot. You have a kid in the top right corner. It's kind of walking across. To me, it almost looks like an angel. Then, you know, takes another shot. He thinks, oh, maybe a vertical composition would be better. And then suddenly, um, a kid pops up in the bottom left corner or he's either moved his position you know got the kid in the crane and then he's taken another step to the left to get a better perspective and another good time to know when to click the shutter is um, in this moment the kid lifts up his crane or it's not crane uh, crutch and so that interesting hand gesture caused him to click and also there's a kid behind him who entered the scene he puts it down click and he takes a step back and he puts a kid in the top right corner click and now the, the kid in the bottom left corner, he gestures with his um, his crutch towards the kid in the top right corner. Click. The kids turn around. Click. Click. And click. So you can see, to make one great image, uh, this image, he didn't just take one photo and just get the hell out of there. I mean, if you're if you if you see the scene, bombed out wall, bunch of kids playing, having a great jolly time. You don't want to regret this uh, this moment and not you know work work the scene, and remember, his you know back in these days they're shooting film and nowadays we we have digital so we have a huge benefit that honestly if I saw the scene and I was shooting digital, I would take in like a hundred two hundred three hundred photos if humanly possible. There's actually a, a very famous photo by Alex Webb. Let me go on the Google's for that. So Alex Webb. Istanbul barber shop. So there's this really famous image by Alex Webb, and you know it's a great photo with lots of complexity and lots of different layers uh, in the classic Alex Webb style. The thing that's interesting about the shot is, you know, I think Alex Webb supposedly shot at least ten rolls of Kodachrome film on this shot. So you know, ten shots, thirty-six shots per roll. So he's taken on film. 36 photos of this scene to get this one shot and you know that's that's them shooting film so one thing to just kind of note is you know if you see a good scene don't just take one or two shots just kind of work the scene and even Cartier Brisson has this quote it's um, sometimes you have to milk the cow a lot to get a little bit of cheese so I guess the cheese could be capturing the decisive moment or creating that great shot but milking the cow is taking lots and lots of images to get as close as you can to, to making that, that great image. Okay, so moving forward. All right, so this is another photo by Elliot Erwitt. If you guys are watching this behind your monitor, you might be chuckling. So what's so funny about this photo? Without stating the obvious, um, you know, there's a man who appears to be a dog and he's also holding another dog. So if any of you guys own any animals or have small children uh, you guys might know that they never look at the lens when you want them to right so there's actually a funny story behind this uh, this photograph so Elliot Erwitt very famous for photographing dogs he's out uh, in New York shooting with um, or not shooting he's just taking a walk with one of his Magnum uh, friends uh, an Asian photographer Magnum I forgot who it was but anyways you know how I talk about the importance of always having your camera with you so this day, Elliot Irwin actually didn't have his camera with him. And he saw the scene. He's like, oh my God, I need to capture this image. So he goes over to his friend and he's like, you know how much I love to photograph dogs. And 
you, you please let me borrow your Leica. And he's, he's like, okay, sure. So he takes the Leica from him and he, he starts making images. And, you know, look at this image. Just kind of think to yourself, how many photos did Elliot Erwitt take of the scene? And also think to yourself, do you think he got the shot in the beginning, middle, or end? Think about it for a second. All right. Do, 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 do. How many photos do you take? Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Okay? So, he shot the entire roll, and I, I, I believe this is probably um, a roll of um, 24 on Tri-X. And when did he get the shot? The last shot. If he only took one shot, two shots, five shots, ten shots, would he have gotten the shot? No. He had to wait and work the scene until he got the last shot. And if you take a close-up look at this contact sheet, you could see the first two shots are just kind of instinctual shots where he's just taking the image because he sees something interesting. But by the third frame, you could see he's kind of positioned it because he knows what he wants. He wants this surreal image where it looks like the dog is actually, um, the man is actually a dog. <laughs> and an interesting thing to note is he actually considered using this frame as well, um, a photo of this little... You know, dog looking to the side, a vertical shot, and where it looks like he has a little hairdo, but in reality, this one was the best shot, and it was the last shot. So once again, um, in the previous contact sheet we saw by Cartier Brisson, you saw he got the best shot in the first shot, but reality is not always so clean like that. Sometimes you get in the middle, um, the beginning, or the end. In this case, he got in the end, and you could see the importance of persistence and working the scene to get that final shot. Another lovely photo by Richard Kelvar from Magnum. Um, I believe you could see this photo in his book, uh, Earthlings. So what's so funny about this photo? Obviously, you might see this character in the center. Nice millhouse character. He's got his eyes kind of bulging out. You have the statue in the top left corner spouting water into his neck, which is kind of funny. It looks like a syringe entering his neck. Then you have this odd uh, gentleman in the bottom right corner who is perhaps his dad or guardian or whatever, looking into you know, some sort of book. And he's got, uh, if you look closely, he's got what in his right hand? Yep, magnifying glass. And, you know, which makes this even funnier because this kid in the center, you know, his eyes are kind of sunk in like the millhouse effect with the, the glasses. So, once again, a question to think to yourself. Did he get the shot in the beginning, middle, or end? Think about that for a second. And also, you might think to yourself, I wonder what number in the frame did he shoot this? So what, what spot in the film do you get this? Okay, if the suspense can't hold you any further back, or I uh, you know what I'm saying, need more coffee. Um, <laughs> he gets this, what, what frame? Nope, not 36. Yep, you guessed it, 37. If you guys ever shot film, uh, there's this thing where when you're kind of banging off the shots, sometimes you're lucky and you get a final shot at the end. And uh, this is this is something I joke a lot about uh, in my workshops. But like, um, have you ever had uh, you know you're cooking eggs for breakfast and you crack open an egg and then there's two yolks inside? You're like, oh, that's kind of gross. But oh, that's kind of cool because I got you know a freebie. But uh, I don't know if I should eat this or not. But <laughs> uh, sometimes you get that little extra something, right? So when you're shooting film, sometimes you get the extra frame, or depending on how you uh, load your film. So Richard Calvar. I actually got really lucky here because had he not had that extra frame, he wouldn't have captured that um, moment where the, the kid looks up. I don't know if I should be calling him a kid. He's probably older than me, but he, he, he looks up and you kind of get that sunken effect. And the interesting thing about this uh, contact sheet is, or just contact sheets in general, a contact sheet is the closest thing you could do in terms of reading the mind of a photographer and really kind of seeing the circumstances in which a photographer made the image. If you see in the top right corner, frame number like one, two, three, four, they're, they're actually turning back, looking back at the fountain. And what I surmise what might have happened in this situation was he's working the scene. He's quite close. He's shooting with a 35 mil lens on his Leica, I believe. They turned around because they wondered, oh, what is this photographer photographing? And they assumed that it was something behind them. So sometimes when you're shooting and working the scene, you're really, really close. People are just going to totally ignore you. They're like, no way this guy's going to be photographing us and taking so many photos of us at such a close proximity. And, you know, as, as long as you keep your camera up to your eye and just keep banging away uh, and making images, people will often assume you're photographing something behind them. 
Another fo- uh, wonderful photograph by, that by Martine Frank. She's uh, was uh, she passed away in the last few years, but incredible photographer, lovely woman from um, what I heard from uh, other Magnum photographers. And she was also the second wife of Henri Cartier-Bresson. So often when you look at her images, you think that they could have been Cartier-Bresson images. But I actually kind of like her photos better than Cartier-Bresson's. No offense, HCB. Um, I think her photos have more uh, life, humor, and uh, often complexity. So very famous photo she's taken, probably one of her iconic images. So take a look at this image and ask yourself, what, what, what about this composition is so wonderful? So for me, I, I love this guy in the bottom left corner, his shadow, um, all the curves you see in this photograph, um, the person in the, the top right corner, you know, kind of doing a yoga downward up dog, makes a nice V composition, the person relaxing, and also the curves which take your eyes throughout the frame, uh, the little balls, the circles in the background. And it's a, it's a wonderful image. And so, you know, once again, ask yourself, you know, did Martin Frank get the shot in the beginning, middle, or the end? Drum roll. Yep, she got this in the middle. And how many photos she take of the scene? Yeah, a whole roll of um, films, so 36 shots. So when you're just looking at this uh, this contact sheet, and I'm going to upload the, the PDF slash uh, keynote for you guys to really kind of analyze this in closer scrutiny. So essentially you see how she kind of worked the scene in different ways. So in the beginning of the frame, she's shooting from the side. It looks like she took some photos of some palm trees or something. And for this composition, she kept working it and she continuously clicked until all the figures lined up the way she did. And you could see kind of like um, a little bit afterwards, uh, you know, the kid turns around looking at the camera and then a woman walks into the frame and then the movement's kind of over. So this is actually one of the big benefits I've personally found shooting film is that there's something in uh, digital called chimping. <laughs> so if you guys have never heard of chimping, uh, the concept behind chimping is that when you're making images, you shoot, click, look into the back of the LCD screen, click, look at the LCD screen, click, look at the LCD screen. It's probably one of the worst things to do in street photography. It's like having a nicotine addiction. And uh, the, the downside of chimping is whenever you take a photo and you look at the back of the LCD screen, it disconnects you from the, from the actual scene, what you need to be photographing. And you could always you know, look for hours at your photos on the LCD screen after you've taken the images. But if you see a great scene, you only have one chance to, to make it. And so by working the scene, and it's better to see a good scene and take 20 photos of it really quickly, then go home and choose your best images, rather than taking one photo, look at it, trying to judge a composition based on your LCD screen, and then maybe taking one or two other, other photos, and then by then, uh, the scene's over. And the only reason you'd be chimping is because A, you might not be familiar with your camera, B, you want to check your composition, or C, um, it's just a habit. And all these are kind of not really good reasons. I mean, if you stick with one camera, one lens for a while, um, and know your camera settings quite well, you shouldn't have to worry about so much of the exposure. And if, if you're shooting raw, you could always adjust the exposure afterwards. I think it's more important to capture the moment than capturing a perfect exposure. Uh, secondly, you should be compose, uh, composing in the viewfinder instinctually. Um, and you know, this often comes with practice. And lastly, uh, if you want to overcome the, this bad habit of chimping, uh, just turn off the auto review in the back of your camera. Uh, I know some guys who are more hardcore, they'll take gaffer's tape and literally tape up their LCD screens. Or, you know, what I do, because I have absolutely no self-control, shoot film. And it really forces you not to chimp because you physically uh, cannot chimp. Or, if you're really rich, you could buy that new Leica M60 or something, which is uh, a Leica M with no LCD screen. Which I think is a sweet camera. I hope Leica actually makes a consumer one that could be affordable by mere mortals like us. So, another photo. One second, I'm gonna reach over, grab a bottle of water. My my throat is trying to get hoarse. Um, all right, I, okay, I've got a nice caffeine buzz. We could uh, power through. So um, this is a very famous photo by Diane Arbus and the famous grenade kid. What do you find interesting about this image? So there's this kid obviously looking distressed um, and there's all these great aspects of the photo which I love um, first of all um, his expression how he has this um, shoulder strap falling off his um, 
his shoulder, which kind of makes it more intense. His left hand looks like a dinosaur claw, and he's got like this strange anxiety and tension to it. And of course, in the right hand, he's got what I like to call the quote, quote, cherry on top, that detail, which makes a great photograph, which is a grenade. <laughs> and so it has all these elements of a really um, uh, great photograph. And one might look at this photo and say, oh, you know, she might have just taken one shot and left. And, you know, how did she make this image? And this is one thing that I like to look at the contact sheets because you could always get a behind the scenes look into how the cook prepared their meal or how the photographer made this image. And so also one thing I wanted to bring up was um, in street photography, often people are like, oh, it has to be candid. You can't ask her permission. You can't interact with your subjects, blah, blah, blah. Honestly, I think that's kind of a load of crap. I think uh, if you look at the, the contact sheets of the some of the most famous street photographers and street photographs, you could see the photographers either given um, implicit permission from the subject, aka the subject might not have said, oh yeah, sure, you can make my photograph, but the photographer might just you know, nod at the person and you know they're looking into the lens and they're obviously okay with being photographed or explicit permission where the photographer might have asked for permission uh, to make this image and the, the subject complies. But in this case, if you look at the contact sheet from Diane Arbus, you could see, um, she, yeah, she shoots an entire role uh, on this on this kid. And it's, I don't know 100% sure the, the full story behind it, but uh, she wasn't 100% sure whether she made you know, the best shot. So she kept working the scene, at the, asked the kid to move around a bit. And you could kind of see how she was able to get the, the best shot in the first shot, but she didn't kind of let up and she kept working the scene. A very famous photo by Martin Parr. It's actually one of my favorites. He photographed this as part of his quote, quote, um, the last resort series when, and I think it's his, is actually his best book. And it's a very funny image. Uh, first of all, you have this person sunbathing face down, um, kid looking over, all these buckets and pails, all these small little details. Uh, this man with his arms crossed away on the top, walking away. And of course, uh, the elephant in the room is this huge tractor in the top right corner about to steamroll this innocent person. And if you looked at the, uh, the funny, actually the funny story behind this is that at the time when Martin Parr was doing this series, he was shooting color film, but he couldn't afford to make color contact sheets. So he, he actually technically saw all these photos in black and white, but when he was making these images, you know, I believe he shot this um, uh, medium format and with a flash, so it kind of gives it this uh, hyper surreal look. But if you look at this contact sheets, you could see um, he took one, two, three, four, five photos of the scene, all at different angles. And <laughs> the shot before, he has a question mark <laughs> saying, oh, I'm not, he's essentially making himself uh, notes for himself thinking, oh, I don't know, if this might be a better shot. And he just kind of um, continues. And so if you see a great shot, once again, try to work the scene by working different angles. So from the top, from the side, and also sometimes it's best to just hold your composition, your frame, and just wait for certain people to enter the scene or certain people to leave the scene to make better images. And to kind of conclude this uh, presentation, uh, I want to show you guys some of my contact sheets. So, you know, oh, you know, Eric's just talking a bunch of crap. He probably just takes one photo and runs away like a little, um, like a little schoolgirl. <laughs> uh, sometimes I do, uh, I won't lie, but I often try my best to work the scene and uh, be persistent. So this is one of my most famous images. Um, I took this in the south of France, Marseille, in, uh, about two years ago. And I'm just walking with my friend Eves and we see this guy just totally passed out um, on the shore and you know I, I didn't really think I, I remember when I was shooting I'm like oh this is kind of interesting so I just um, you know, took a bunch of uh, photos and I didn't really think that it was a great shot until one of my friends um, uh, you know often one thing I do is on my computer I'll make a folder called maybes and then I'll load these photos into my iPad and when I meet other photographers in person and I want feedback I'll show them my huge folder of quote, quote, maybe photos, and then ask them their honest opinion on uh, these photographs. And so he actually spotted this photo. He's like, wow, Eric, this is probably one of the best photos you've ever made. I'm like, what, really? And upload to Flickr, and then, you know, obviously favorites shouldn't be a good indicator whether a shot's good or not, but it's probably one of my most favorite shots, maybe like over 700 faves or something. I don't know. But anyways, uh, numbers beside, uh, I like it because it kind of, you know, it's an open photograph in the sense that you don't exactly know what's happening to this guy. His, you know, maybe his lost at shore. You know, if you guys ever watched that um, Tom Hanks movie, um, 
I don't know, I forget what it's called at the moment, but you know, when his castaway and he shipwrecked, whatever. And funny enough, one of my students actually mentioned this uh, in a workshop in Australia. There's this very famous photograph, um, and the name of the photographer is um, Max Dupain, or Dupin, uh, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce the name. But it's an, it's <laughs> they showed me this photo that he shot like in the 50s, I think, in 54, or maybe earlier, I don't even know. But <laughs> it's just funny how sometimes history could um, repeat itself. So I didn't actually know this photograph when I, when I made my interpretation. Uh, I just kind of saw it, but it's just kind of funny to, uh, to think about how history repeats itself. But anyways, uh, for this photograph, I didn't just take one photo and leave. Um, I shot it from some different angles. So this is my contact sheet. And so you could see um, the first photograph, I just kind of instinctively clicked. The second photograph, what I actually did was I put my camera super, super low uh, to the ground and tried to get a super low angle. So for this photo, I actually didn't shoot through uh, the viewfinder and I clicked off some photos um, super low. Then I stood up, clicked again, and that was actually an even better composition than the first composition. Then for the last two photos, I was thinking like leave Freelander and trying to get my own little self-portrait in there. And uh, yeah, I took a photo of those guys from behind. And actually, I think I have a photo of the the behind the scenes of me um, making uh, that photograph. Let's see, where did I? So yeah, I'm very vain. I have entire full, yeah, here it is. So yeah, for um, <laughs> This, my, my friend um, Eves uh, took this photograph so you can see the behind the scenes shot. Um, this photograph, when I took super low, um, I actually didn't look through the viewfinder. I mean, looking back at it, what I probably should have done was, you know, not been such a, a wimp and just laid on my stomach and started photographing with um, the, the camera to my eye. But I was just trying to get a nice low angle. Before I forget, I could add this to the slides. Do -do -do. Oh god, that's huge. Doo -doo -doo. Okay, so um, you guys could have access to this uh, this fun photograph um, later when I upload the slides. Okay, anyways, and these are, so you can see this was the, the first shot I got. Slightly crooked and I think a little bit too much negative space between the man and the, the boats behind him. The second photo, that's you can see these super low angle photographs I made. I'm not looking through the viewfinder, I'm just um, clicking. And that's here. Um, and then this is when I stood up, actually looked through the viewfinder and made this image. This one was the best one. And from behind, <laughs> right? And okay, so this is another photograph uh, I shot in Istanbul last year. And if you look at this photo, look at the expression of this guy, what kind of expression do you think he has? Some people have told me like murder, ho homicidal maniac kind of thing. It looks quite scary. Uh, I would have to agree. But photographs lie, they never tell the, the, the truth. What actually happened in this photograph was um, I was on the, the metro with my friend Charlie Kirk um, in Istanbul. I think we were doing a workshop, um, not that day of, but um, we did a workshop um, that week. And we're on this super crazy uh, crowded metro. I felt like I was back like uh, in Tokyo or Korea where the subways get super crammed. And I see all these people just kind of, you know, just kind of like fish in a barrel. And I just turned around and brought up my camera and started clicking. And the actual scene, this is actual context. <laughs> so you might look at this photo, you're like, wow, this guy totally doesn't look like that guy. <laughs> And so pretty much the, the backstory was I just turned around and, you know, I had my, my Leica 35mm um, SF20 flash and I just took one shot and everyone just started laughing. It's like, wow, this Asian guy's crazy. And they just started laughing, right? And one, one thing I like to do in street photography is when I'm taking photos and people know that I'm taking photos, I'll just look at them and say, oh, one shot, serious, don't smile. Mm. And um, so the second shot, you could see he's kind of becoming a little more serious. And by the last shot, everyone's kind of just ignoring me. And this is the funny thing is sometimes the longer you work the scene, people just begin to um, ignore you. And to me, people might say, oh, you know, Eric is in this uh, fake photograph because, you know, he's just posing for you, blah, blah, blah. I don't think there's any quote, quote, 
truth or quote quote reality behind uh, street photography nor i don't think we have an ethical obligation to make photos that are totally quote quote authentic because you could argue that nothing is authentic and blah 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 i mean even when you're when you're making a photograph you're not shooting with a fisheye lens all the time you're only selecting a certain part of what you see and that becomes subjective and to me the the feeling of a photograph is more important than the actual you know cool cool truth behind a photograph so yeah i think all photographs lie and you know none of not all my photos are candid i would say about 80 percent of my photos are candid without permission and 20 percent are posed and so what's the, the distinction when someone asks me yeah i'll show them my contact sheets and i'll tell them the story behind my photographs but i think it's it's often the mystery behind the photos which make them more interesting uh this is another photo i shot in new york city and pretty much what i like about this photo is of course you know this this hat you see on this hat probably won't be the most pleasant experience and i also quite like the the composition i like the the high angle looking down the colors of the yellow uh the yellow the gold slash purple in the background stripes and for this this photograph uh, i saw this woman on the streets and i'm like oh my god i love your hat to my if i made a few photos and she said yeah sure and i actually shot this all on the rico gr so i'm shooting with lcd screen in the back of the screen working all these different angles and so you could see these are these are my contact sheets and you could see uh you know my train of thought and i'll explain so the first photo was a vertical shot click second one i put the camera up a little higher click third shot put up the camera a little bit higher click and then I thought that, oh, maybe a horizontal composition might be more simple, so click. Um, and at this point, I already kind of know what my composition is, but all I'm waiting for is for the background to clear up. So another big pro tip I'll give you in street photography is that when you're shooting and clicking and working the scene, one of the most important things is look at the background while you're shooting. Once you've kind of established your composition, your framing, and put your subject in the center of the frame or however you want to frame them, consciously look at the background and the edges of the frame when you're shooting so this entire time look in the background the edges click 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 you can still see there's a bunch of clutter in the bottom right corner the top right corner and then the last photo before the this person left i made this image and even though there's a little bit clutter in the top right corner for the most part the the clear uh, the street is clear so I'm, I'm quite pleased with this image another one of my most famous images uh this nice red cowboy guy um so funny enough, some of my best photos I've taken are actually not on the streets, but like in cafes. So I actually shot this in Starbucks. Um, <laughs> some of you guys know that I really like coffee and you might be like, oh, and my, those of you guys watching from like Melbourne or Seattle or any other good coffee place, like, yeah, Starbucks is not a cafe, but whatever. Um, I think I shot this like three years ago before I was really into good coffee. So yeah, don't blame me. But if I need a, a good shot of um coffee and i don't have um, any other resources of course i'll go to starbucks and you know it's good to do work there anyways so i see this guy and you know just chilling there with a red cowboy outfit i'm like oh my god this guy's amazing and i was actually quite nervous my heart was thumping and i just thought to myself if i don't approach this guy and ask for permission to make this image i'm going to regret it for the rest of my life so anyways i go up to him sit down with him and actually just started chatting with him for about 15 minutes or so quite a quite a long time and you know he told me he he invented the internet and stuff like that eh, i was like i don't really buy that but um he he essentially was a very friendly guy quite eccentric and at the end of our conversation i asked him oh if i if it was okay if i made a few photos of him and he said yeah sure why not and so i started working the scene and um the first question he asked me is what do you want me to do and i say i don't know just fix your tire or something so click 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 and this was before i knew how important it was to to work the scene honestly i would have i probably should have shot an entire roll of film on him but you know the first shot actually ended up coming out quite well uh, i like the the hand gesture and his overall expression the colors in the background like the blues the yellows the reds nice warm colors um another photo i took more recently during a road trip in indianapolis um this is part of my only in america series that i plan to work on for the next few years hopefully it'll be uh, i can make a book out of it but anyways um we're in line we're in indianapolis and i believe i shot these all on the contacts t3 which is a point and shoot film camera uh 35 mil lens also portrait 400 it's the only film i shoot and anyways see this guys um a bunch of these maybe in the past super badass dudes now just kind of <laughs> waiting in this like cafeteria line and yeah i like the composition 
and you look at the contact sheets, you could see how I kind of worked the scene in different ways. Um, the first ones, close-ups of these guys' jackets, then taking a step back. And this is another important lesson in street photography. Sometimes it's better not to be super, super close, but it's better to kind of take a step back and kind of get a sense of um, space. Um, I think when I first started shooting street photography, I was super obsessed with always being super, super close, no matter how uh, what the situation was. But now I'm actually learning certain situations it's better to actually take a step back and get a more sense of place. And yeah, the best shot I got was somewhere in the middle. So these were the, the close-ups. One, two, three. And that was the shot. Four, five. Nice hand gesture. Six, seven, eight. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, this might be one of the last ones. Uh, I think we have a few more. But anyways, um, so the story behind this photograph is... I was doing a road trip through Arizona, uh, a road trip from Michigan down to like uh, New Orleans West through Texas. And we made our ways through Tucson. And um, during this, uh, you know, me, me and my uh, girlfriend, Cindy, were in line uh, about to eat a Euro. And from the corner of my eye, we see this amazing woman with this red hair and this yellow shirt. And I'm like, oh my God, this woman looks amazing. And I'm, I'm like thinking to myself, I'm going to regret it if I don't ask to make her photograph. And, you know, she's in the restaurant eating. So I'm just not going to walk over and just snap a candid photo. You know, I'll talk to her. So I went up to her and I said, oh, excuse me, miss. I love your red hair. I love your outfit. You look amazing. Do you mind I made a few photos of you? And she goes, oh, you Asian people always like to make photos of me, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, sure, why not? And then I'm like, oh yeah, you do look amazing. So I started making some images. And if you look at the contact sheets, some people look at this photo and they think off the bat, oh, she just, it looks like it was just a candid shot. Like I shot it without her permission and, you know, oh, Eric, you're such an asshole, you're so rude, whatever. But the, that actually wasn't the case. Um, so if you look at the, the contact sheet, um, this is the story. The first photograph, she was like, so what do you want me to do? And I said, I don't know, just show me your fingernails. And she starts laughing. And she's like, what is she doing? And I don't know what she's doing here. And then this scene, she goes, oh, how does my lipstick look? And then that's when I made this image. Um, I couldn't have even predicted that she would make that gesture. But you could see sometimes, um, this is what I like to call the unguarded moment or those in-between moments where... The subject, it's kind of a candid shot in the sense that you didn't pose them and ask them to do that, but it's a natural expression they did. And it's not when they're just kind of posing and smiling for the camera. And I think this is the best shot. And you could also see the difference between I shot some with flash and without flash. So this is with the flash and this is without a flash. You could see it's a huge difference. Um, shooting with a flash, especially in color, adds this nice pop to the image and you know, further saturates the colors. Whereas without flash, yeah. Um, another photograph I shot in, um, in Garden Grove, uh, and yeah, it's essentially in, um, this dive bar and, uh, was, actually was sitting in the middle of it during the day. I had to do, um, an assignment, uh, where I had to visit a bar and uh, do some punching bags or whatever, but essentially I'm, I'm punching this, um, one of those little game machine punching bags. And, you know, from the corner, I see this, you know, all these girls walking around in bikinis. I don't know if this is only in the States or in other countries, but it's kind of weird, like um, all these weird middle-aged men drinking and these hot babes behind the counter who are bartenders and all just wearing bikinis. Essentially, I really wanted to make a photo of one of these bartenders, but I'm like, I don't know if this is appropriate and I'm like super nervous. And I essentially um, approach her and, um, and yeah, I just started making some small talk and I was like, oh, you know, I love your tattoos and, you know, I love your, um, you know, <laughs> I don't know what else to say. I think I just said, I like your tattoos. And she's like, oh, yeah, and she's joking. She saw me doing the punching bag thing. And she's like, oh, how'd you do? I'm like, oh, not so good. And I said, oh, um, you know, I love your tattoos. I'm a photographer. Do you mind if I made a, a few photos of you and your tattoo? So by saying you and your tattoo, it puts less emphasis on her more on the tattoo. And she said, yeah, sure. Why not? Um, and I was like super excited. I didn't actually have my, um, I think my, I think my Leica was in my bag. I actually had the Ricoh GR with me. So I'm like, oh, whatever. Use the best camera I have at the moment. Turn on the flash, shooting in P mode. And I was like, oh no, just want you just flex your muscles and, you know, point to your tattoo. And she's like, oh, sure. And I make one photo here. And the second photo, she looks at me. And I didn't really know which one was the better photo until I got home. But essentially I decided I preferred the first one because it's a little more mysterious. Also, you could see more of her eyelashes here, 
Whereas the second one is a little bit too posy. It's like a Facebook profile picture. Uh, another photograph I made in a train in uh, Amsterdam. And you can see this old guy. He's kind of looking out and you know, it's kind of a somber photograph. And I shot this with uh, a Ricoh GR1S. It's a point and shoot film camera, 28 mil lens. And I'm sitting across from him. And if you look at this image, you might think to yourself, oh, this guy looks so lonely and sad and you know, I wonder what's on his mind and you can interpret this photo in different ways. And so you know how I talked about a little bit earlier, the photographs tell lies. So if you look at this photo, you might think, oh, this kind of lonely, sad old man. But in reality, he's actually sitting next to his wife. So <laughs> some people have a joke that like, oh, that's exactly why he looks sad and lonely because he's married. No, I'm just kidding. But um, you could see this is the, the progression of images that I shot. So um, this was the first image. Then I, uh, he closed his eyes. I made a vertical photo to try to get his hands. Then a shot with him and his wife because I didn't know which one was a better shot. Then took a step back or leaned back more in my seat and just photographed a horizontal um, a horizontal shot with him closing his eyes and his hands. So anyways, uh, to sum up, uh, when you're shooting street photography, it's really important to work the scene. Don't just take one photo and leave. Um, and if you want to be given an, assi an assignment to better learn how to work the scene, I like to call this the thousand photograph challenge. <laughs> So what is the thousand photograph challenge? The concept is if you have a hard time um, sticking around, working the scene for your assignment is in an entire day, you have to take at least a thousand photos in the streets by the end of the day. Um, and essentially, I'm not telling you that you should always be shooting a thousand photographs at every scene, but it's just important to always be, it's better to overshoot the undershoot a scene. And if you are the type of person that you don't, think you shoot enough and you want to learn how to better work the scene is better to overshoot so just for a day just try to shoot a thousand photos and of course over time you're going to regress to the mean and shoot a more comfortable number but um yeah essentially when you see a good scene work the scene if you ask for permission don't be afraid you know try to take you know if you see a good scene try to take at least five to ten photos at least um and if you shoot digital fill up your sd card if necessary but yeah anyways if you guys have any more questions about working the scene and street photography check that out also going to give a shameless plug to my blog. So if you haven't checked in that Eric Kim Street Photography blog, I think you just Google Eric Kim blog. And yeah, you could see me in the top of the Googles. You can learn more about street photography on my blog. And uh, yeah, if you want to learn how to, you know, better work the scene or you know, build more confidence in street photography, you can always check out my upcoming workshops Yeah, and see where in the, the world you would like to join me at some places, spots in Chicago, Toronto, New York, a new workshop in Vienna, Paris, Berlin, Stockholm, New Orleans, Morocco, Istanbul, Prague. It's going to be a busy year, so check out some of those dates. See what tickles your fancy. But until then, yeah, learn more about street photography. I think on my I think on my YouTube channel, one of my New Year's resolutions is to create more video, um, these kind of video lectures, which I hope um, build value and um, make myself redundant. So I have a how to overcome your fear of shooting street photography lecture as well as how to be invisible when shooting street photography. Um, and if you guys have any other suggestions for any other videos you guys would like, just let me know and I'll, I'll record those as well. All right, love you guys to death. Um, uh, have a good day and take care. Peace out.